Want help to grow your business? Download Bryn, the world's first business advisor in your pocket. To find out more, visit Bryn.ai or search the App Store today. Hi there, I'm Amanda Stevens, and welcome to Retail Renegades, where we explore the inside stories of retail success stories, disruptors and entrepreneurs shaking the establishment, carving new niches, and challenging the traditional bricks and mortar retail model. Of course, if you'd like to join the conversation, you can join us on your favorite social media platform using the hashtag Retail Renegades. And joining us today is Matt Mullins from Sand Hill Road, the company responsible for revolutionizing the pub and licensed hotel scene in Melbourne, Australia. Matt and his partners have taken a very unique consumer and community-centric approach to not only the design of their pubs, but how their staff are trained and how they create unique offerings that build incredible levels of loyalty. It's an innovative and disruptive model, and they've now replicated it across 10 venues across Melbourne. And it's a story that serves up schooners and pints of lessons for retailers in every industry. Maddie, welcome to Retail Renegades. Thank you, Amanda. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. Now, you've got a really interesting story because I understand that you originally wanted to be a dairy farmer. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's not so much that I wanted to be a dairy farmer, it's perhaps more that I was probably going to be a dairy farmer. So I grew up in a very small little country town in Gippsland uh, where everyone around us were dairy farmers. So we, my brother and I, Andy and I, we grew up um, hanging out with our mates early in the mornings when we stayed at their place, you know, we'd go out and milk the cows. And so it was just part of life in the town that I grew up in. Mm. Um, I'm not sure I was ever really that keen on being a dairy farmer. The early mornings didn't quite make that much sense to me. And perhaps that's part of the reason I became a publican instead. <laughs> so it's about late, late nights, not early mornings, right? Because it's quite a transition, isn't it? Bit of a transition, yeah. So well, this town that we grew up in was, was a tiny little town. Uh, you know, the primary school that we were in had, I think, 60 odd students. We had a very small little general store and one little pub. Mm. And Andy and I look back now on that experience. And we look back on that pub and, and think about perhaps the impact it's had on the sort of businesses that we operate now. I mean, the, the mm. pub was the centre of our town's life, mm. like most pubs have been for hundreds of years. And, um, and I, I look back now and think, well, there's probably something about that little pub that kind of got into our heads. Sparked something in I you. I think so, yeah. yeah. But a little more than the dairy farming anyway. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So your first pub was the Commercial Club uh, Hotel in Fitzroy. Uh, tell us about that process of that, you know, the very first pub and the design and the whole process that you went through. Yeah, right. Well, the, the, the first pub was something the boys and I came to. My partners, Andy, who's my brother, and Tom and Doug, the other two partners. We, we came to it um, somewhat accidentally, really. Dougie was a hotel manager. Uh, so we'd finished university and he went out and got a job as a hotel manager like so many art students do. And, um, and he decided he'd open up his own pub, spend some time talking to the boys and I about the various expertise that we had, mm -hmm. such as it was. Um, I was in marketing and PR, the other boys were in finance and broking. And, uh, and after a series of conversations, we said, well, actually, you know what? We don't love our jobs that much either. Um, this pub thing could be okay. Um, and, and this, uh, this happens over a period of time, you know. We were, mm. we were 23, 24, 25, you know. And, um, and that's a time in your life when you can probably, you know, dream big. Mm. Um, we certainly weren't at all concerned about the idea of changing careers midstream. So and in our mind, it, it was early stream. It didn't feel risky? Like you're, you're in a really safe corporate role? And well, you all were, really. <laughs> it didn't feel risky. We didn't feel the risk to quite the same extent that our mothers did. Yeah, though. right. So, so it was very risky for mum and dad. Some tough conversations. They were freaking out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember, yeah. In fact, my brother Andy, I remember being there when he told mum that he was going to go out on his own, well, you know, with partners, but he was going to leave his job and go into a pub. And mum, God love her, mm -hmm. mum just lost it. And she looked at me and said, well, thank God you're not doing it. And I said, "Actually, oh, I'm going with him. <laughs> Yeah, it was chaos there for a little while. Um, that didn't last too long. Though. Yeah, Our yeah. parents worked out very quickly that it, it was the right path for us. Yeah. Yes, it did seem risky. Um, probably less risky when you have that bravado of youth. Mm. We didn't have that, that much to lose either. You know, mm. None of us had families at the time. Uh, mm. We didn't have wives or children. Um, we didn't have large investments we had to protect mm. or corral. And, and so the, the reality is you know, we probably didn't understand 
the, the risk that was there. Um, and and maybe that's part of your success. I, I think it was blind, a big part blind, of the time. There's a lot yes. to be said for blind optimism. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And so, so that's the first part. And, and tell us, at, at what point did you realise that it was, it was working? And then at what point then did you decide that perhaps you were going to look at an expansion plan? Not straight away. It took us a couple of years. Yep. So, and, and I think that might have been part of the, the youth. Um, there was blind optimism, but there was also just blindness. Mm. Now, we were really blind to a lot of things about the business environment. Mm. Um, we didn't have a strong vision for our, our organisation, our company. We started a pub. It was as simple as that. Mm. And for a couple of years, that's all that needed to be. Um, so, you know, not surprisingly, in the early days, we certainly started to think a lot more about... Um, about where we might go from here. Mm. Um, but we weren't in a desperate rush to build a vision for our company. Um, we were focused on, on some other elements of the business early on, like the sort of attitude we wanted our business to live with and to breathe with, um, the way we wanted to treat the people who interact with our business, either consumers or customers. That's the sort of stuff that we were building early on, mm. uh, without even realising it to some extent. Um, and then at other times, more consciously. Um, we, in the early days, we were focused much more on things like um, a, I guess, an unofficial motto that the four of us mm. try and live by in business, which is laugh, learn, live, love life. So that came to us and has been our guiding philosophy, if you like, uh, well before um, the idea that we were going to be publicans mm. and we were going to run a group of inner city F&B pubs. That came much later. Mm. And so in these early days, as you say, you were working on doing things differently a little bit, perhaps in the design and also the, the customer service side of things. Where did yep. the inspiration for that come from? Is it, just, is it a, a very conscious decision you made early that you wanted to do things differently? Interesting. It wasn't conscious, mm. but it was definitely there. So the boys and I had a strong idea um, that if we were going to go into pubs, our first pub, if we were going to go into our first pub, we wanted to look at different ways to do it, new ways to do it. And it was a good time to be thinking like this too because coming, um, coming out of the last century into a new one, this was around about the year 2000 and the year before, so 1999 when we were planning, year 2000 we opened, it was a really exciting time in hospitality and, you know, frankly, in the business world in general, right? So um, Sydney had the Olympics and Sydney had been on a program for a couple of years where they were really, really improving every element of the hospitality offering. Um, the, the Maryvale Group, for instance, mm. arrived mm. really mm. in Sydney at the establishment and really revolutionised um, the nation's hospitality. Shook things up big time. Mm. Very much, yeah. Mm. Um, so it was an exciting time. Melbourne, on the other hand, we, 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 we'd, we'd been a lot sleepier in Melbourne and we didn't have the impetus of the Olympics to really drive innovation. Um, and so in actual fact, the drivers of innovation were, were small operators who came along and thought, hey, you know what? We can probably shake things up a little bit ourselves here. Mm. Um, and that's, that's what we were looking at doing. And there were some others who were doing the same thing. But, um, so, for instance, we came along in that pub scene and we, we thought, well, there are some things that we can look at here. Um, we, were, we, were, we laugh about it now. We were like the first hipsters. Right? We were hipsters before it was cool to be before hipsters. Before it was cool. <laughs> so we were doing things like... We, went, we were in Melbourne's north too. Fitzroy's mm. a suburb um, just on the border of Melbourne's north, which is kind of hipsterville in Melbourne now. Mm. Um, we, for instance, said, well, we don't want any advertising in our hotel. And this was anathema back then. I mean, it was mm. a really unusual idea. Our taps, for instance, where we're, all so much, we're all so used to now having a bank of beer taps, for instance, mm. at the front of any bar with the logos of all the beers that you sell. Um, and we said, nah, we don't need that. All our taps are blank, with black handles. There's nothing about the beer taps, for instance, that will tell you what beer is being served. Um, we want that to be part of a conversation. Right. So a customer won't know what's on tap here until they ask, mm. and that gives us the in for a conversation because mm. the pub is all about the conversation and always has been. Yeah. And, and we were seeing little things that were starting to take away from that. Um, I mean, every time you put a sign up on a wall, you definitely take one element of conversation away. Um, now, that's often a good thing, like, granted, but sometimes it's limiting. Yeah. And we thought there was a real opportunity to maximise that conversation. Mm. So with that strategy, you must have also 
had to have come a commitment to training your staff and developing them to a point where they could literally engage at that level. Absolutely. A and yeah. was that, what, what were the lessons that, there? That was absolutely central, mm, yeah. Mm. Well, um, we were behind the bar most of the time. Mm. Um, so Doug managed the hotel for the first year. The four of us worked behind the bar uh, days and nights. And if we weren't working behind the bar, we were in the pub. Mm. Um, we lived upstairs with 17 mates. Can you believe it? Wow. <laughs> I can imagine. It was, a, it was a really fun year. I bet. A little unhealthy, yeah. but a lot of yeah. fun. Yeah. Um, You're doing so a lot of research. You're doing oh, a lot of, lot of research, research in your own venue. Yeah. Yep. yeah. It, it actually was wonderfully insightful, though, because mm. not a second of trade went by in those first probably two years that we missed. Mm. And that was really wonderful. Now, that's, that's not a luxury that most businesses get or business owners get in the retail world. It's very rare to be present for every transaction that your business conducts. Now, don't you wish that you were, though? Mm. I mean, every retailer on earth would love to think that he had personal insight into that transaction and that one and that one. Absolutely. And we did. Yeah. And it was really wonderful. And one of the main things it did to us was prove how vital the connection is between our customer and our staff. Mm. Absolutely. Let's talk about that for a minute because I know for a lot of retailers and business owners in general, the challenge is, yes, you want to be there for every transaction, but if you are for every minute, hour, day that you're working in a business, you're not working on the business. Yep. So at what point did you make the transition from literally being there behind the bar yep. day in, day out, night in, night out, yep. to then taking a step back and saying, okay, let's expand and let's yeah. take more of a working right. on the business approach. Well, th th there were two things that, that brought about that change for us. One was when we decided that we would expand beyond one venue mm. towards two and three uh, and then more. And we knew that, that there was an inevitable change in the way we could be involved in each business. Mm. Um, and the second thing was that our lives changed. So we went from being mid 20 year old kids having a ball to being young adults with um, partners, um, wives, and then not long after, children. Mm. And, and we made a decision pretty early on that, uh, I mean, you can still be a publican in your pub all day, every day with a wife and kids, right? I mean, that's how a lot of publicans have done it. Mm. Um, but it didn't seem particularly healthy, and it wasn't, it wasn't the choice that the boys and I made. Uh, and we all made a similar choice um, for the same sorts of reasons. You know, we... we, we felt it was important to have a balanced lifestyle sure. in a really simple way, and there'd be a price we'd pay for that, we weren't going to spend so much time in our pubs. The end result of that is you've got to mitigate the downside. Mm. So we put in place a few things that, that did just that. So we started focusing very, very early on our staff. So the key to that was to hire the right managers and senior executives, knowing that they'd be filling our spot um, often, and to look after them as well as we possibly could. Mm. And then the next rung down is our other full-timers and our casuals. Yep. And of course, our workforce is primarily casualised. Um, so of our 300-odd staff now, um, the vast majority of those, some 200 or more, are casual workers. Um, so that brings its own challenges. That's common to almost mm. all retailers, yep. frankly, um, and certainly in hospitality. Um, it, it meant that we had to focus very heavily on those staff, and so we did. Um, some of the things that, that, we, that we did you know, from the early days was to maintain the connection between us and our staff. So even though we weren't going to be there at all times, the, the, the greater the connection between us and, of course, our philosophy, the idea of laugh, learn, live, love, life, that philosophy that drove us, mm. um, that we thought was important in their work as well. Um, so we decided to invest a lot of time in spending time as owners with our staff. Mm. We thought that was probably the number one thing we could do. Um, and so we, we made that our base. The base of our relationship with our staff was about a personal connection. And we invested time. Um, and, and what did that look like? Was it weekly, monthly? To continue enjoying this presentation, download Bryn, the world's first business advisor in your pocket. To find out more, visit Bryn.ai or search the App Store today.